What's going on guys? So today's video is going to be a little bit about the history of the balisong or butterfly knife as a lot of people know it. Um, as you guys saw in my uh, recent trade video, this is an 80s era balisong that I traded for by Taylor Seto. This is the manila folder. And uh, what kind of prompted this video was a conversation I had with someone a couple days ago. I've had a very similar conversation about a year or two ago with someone else. And basically how it went was the person contacted me and said, hey, I really like butterfly knives, I want to get into it, but I want to get like a really old one. Like the oldest balisong ever from the 90s. And I kind of said, well, they're a lot older than that. Um, I've personally owned balisongs from the 80s when I first got into knife collecting. And, you know, the very first time I saw a, a butterfly knife in use, I was like totally amazed. I had to have one. It was the coolest thing in the world. Of course, once I got one, I wanted to play with it. I wanted to do cool moves. And the rest is history, right? Uh, but I've personally owned bow songs that were from the 80s, and that's about the oldest ones that I've ever owned. However, it goes back a lot further from the 90s or even the 80s. Uh, bow songs are actually created in the late 1800s, believe it or not. So, to uh, back my claim um, to this person, because they didn't really believe me, I broke out my old Bernard Levine book, okay? In fact, these books are starting to be collectible. I see these for sale some places for 50 or upwards of $100 or more, depending on the uh, edition. This is the fourth edition. This one was released in 1997. Quick background on this. I went with a, uh, my family on a family vacation to Lancaster, Pennsylvania to see the Amish country, which is a lot of fun. I made pretzels and you know saw homemade furniture and all kinds of stuff. But there was a knife shop there called Country Knives, I believe. And I think they're still in business. And it was like a museum, like a, a thousand knives. Uh, absolutely amazing. The prices were very high. So instead of walking out with a knife, I walked out with this book. And it was around 97, you know, when I got this book, because it was brand new when I got it. And my parents bought it for me as a gift. There's the price tag that we paid for it. We probably paid a little bit more because I'm sure because of everything else being so overpriced in the store, in the store, this is probably like 30 or $35, something like that. Uh, but I've had this book ever since and it makes me feel old, but I've had this book for 20 years now, about 20 years. I've been referencing this book for all kinds of stuff. What's so cool about this is this is a great guide in general for old, um, you know, knife values, okay? Thousands of knife values in this book. However, besides that, you can kind of skim through this and read it like a book. There's a lot of knife history in here. So much stuff that you probably never even heard of, never knew about, totally amazing. And during the discussion about the battle song, I happen to remember that there was a little uh, section, I marked it here so I wouldn't forget it, on the battle song, the history of the battle song, or what they call a hidden knife. So basically a knife design that the blade is in fact hidden. So it doesn't, you know, seem like a knife right away to most people. So here it is, there's a whole section here. I'm sure this is in other versions of this book. All right, foreign exotic primitive and historical folding knives continued. In the uh, fourth edition here, this happens to be page 316 and 317, but this goes into some of the uh, pretty interesting designs, hidden knives. This knife up here basically has a, a faux uh, handle scale that pops off. You can see a key in there, you know, so you can hide stuff in the actual knife. There's a couple other designs. Pretty interesting. But of course, then we have the battle song. So I'm just going to read you this little section here and show you a couple dates that might be surprising to some people. Uh, but just a quick note on the book itself. I mean, these range anywhere from $20 to $120 online. You can find them, but they are dwindling. I mean, back when I got into knives, these were much more available. There were newer editions coming out. But like I said, I mean, as time goes on, less and less people are interested in history books on knives and, and knife value books because this is predominantly, um, you know, based around traditional knife patterns and stuff. Uh, and, you know, more people are into the tactical and, and the new age knives, you know. So this is like kind of a dying art, but very, very cool. If you ever see one of these at a garage sale or something and you're semi into knives, it's totally worth picking up. And it's a very, very interesting read. But if nothing else, if you find old knives, you can use it as a reference, not only to when these knives are made, but obviously in some cases their values. So here's just a quick little read on the bell song. It says, French, Germany, USA, Philippines, uh, butterfly knife. Two to eight inches long closed, a pivot handle knife similar to the previous ones, except that the half handles are side by side rather than back to back. The latch mechanism is at the end, not internal. Evidently a French innovation, 18th or early 19th century. 
Several styles were made in Germany in the 1880s and exported to the U.S. Miller Bros. of Connecticut, patented a sheet metal handled version in June 1887. Butterfly fruit knives were made in England under H&H &H Fields British patent of May 3rd, 1898. A stout version was patented in the U.S. by Charles Billings of Connecticut in 1908. These knives were made by Billings and Spencer with uh, nickel-plated knurled steel handles. Because it has no back spring, the butterfly knife can be made using simple technology, which is why the balisong was adopted as a national Foley knife of the Philippines. Usually materials were of brass frames, horn handles. Values, French uh, with champagne blade, around $200. German with stag handles, about $150. Uh, Philippines, $15 to $75, depending on size and quality. Japanese or Italian, $5 to $35, finished by Hackman. Actually had a Hackman balisong back in the day. Nylon handles, 30 bucks. American versions, Miller Bros, $175. Billing and Spencer, $550. Waltco, circa 1950s, $95. California made by Balasong Inc., $125 to $275. Firm is now Benchmade Knife Co. of Oregon. So Benchmade, before it was Benchmade, was Balasong Inc. Very interesting. Also an important note, the values in this older edition are not applied to today. Obviously, this is the values of these particular knives 20 years ago. Those values have gone up significantly since the publication of this book. That's why there were so many different editions as time goes on. Obviously, the values of things change. So anyway, I just wanted to make a video on this subject because I do find it extremely fascinating. I, and I have found that a lot of people just don't know how old this knife design is. This knife, how it works, how it functions, you know, the idea that someone came up with this design, this is as old as any of the knives you see on the cover of this book. And a lot of people would not have known that otherwise. So I wanted to spread that information because I think it's pretty cool. Also, just talk about traditional knives in general. I had a lot of great feedback on my recent video on the big trade, you know. Uh, so many people, uh, especially younger viewers, like 13, 14, 15, you know, sending messages saying, hey, you know, I, I always want the new Spider Co. this or Benchmade that or, or Kershaw this, but now I kind of like, you know, the old traditional knives. I, I want to get a buck knife now. I want to I get an old trade. I want to do this. I want to do that. I think that's awesome. I, I can't tell you how important it is to me to occasionally talk about these types of knives, these traditional knife patterns, because this is the history. This is where it all started, you know. Uh, carrying something like this, is it going to be as effective as your modern day you know, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Kershaw Blur, just throw it out there, just a random knife, right? Uh, no, it's not as convenient. You know, you have to use two hands to open this knife. The steel is not going to be as good. You know, well, I don't know about a Kershaw Blur, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, modern knives have better materials, they're put together better. Obviously, they're more convenient being one hand opening, you know, flicking it open, it's ready to go. Shut it real quick, strong locking mechanisms. That's why we tend to use them just like newer cars. You don't necessarily use older cars because they're not as efficient, right? So I just don't want to see this die out. I think that there's a couple generation gaps. Your great, great, great grandfather carried a knife everywhere he went from the time he was probably three, four years old <laughs> up until, you know, the day that he died. But there was a couple generations there where society said, no, knives are not good. You can't have them at school. There's no reason to carry them anymore. It's modern day. You don't need to carry a pocket knife. And I think that's sad, to be honest, because they're amazing tools. But for some reason, a lot of people see them as weapons. And they think it's silly that you have knives. The very people that tell me, you don't need to carry a knife, well, they have scissors in their desk drawer. Where's a pair of scissors? It's two knives, right? But people don't see it like that. Hey, you don't need a knife, really? Says the person who just prepared their chicken dinner with a knife. The same person who went out to dinner and used a knife. People just don't see it, you know. Having a pocket knife is taboo these days in some areas and in some circles. Obviously, there's still thousands of people that carry them and no one really cares. But it's just, uh, I don't know, it's going in a bad direction. And I think, uh, I think knives are good. Knives are man's oldest useful tool besides fire. If we never had knives, I wouldn't be making this video right now. They'd probably still be drooling on each other and chasing animals in the woods. So anyway, I'm rambling. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. I just think uh, traditional knives are just as cool as, you know, new age stuff. So I just, I like talking about it on occasion. And, uh, you know, it's perfect timing with all those old vintage knives, uh, you know, for the trade video. It was just a really cool chance to kind of bring back that type stuff onto the channel and onto videos and, and to spark interest in those types of knives 
for a lot of different viewers that might not think of it otherwise. You know, you go to a garage sale, you see it all night, it's no big deal. Maybe after watching this video, it's pretty cool. Maybe you get the thing. Maybe you buy a book like this and you look it up and you learn about it, learn when it was made, learn where it was made, you know. Uh, I call myself cutlery lover because I love it all. Anything that's sharp fascinates me. Doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to be brand new, doesn't have to be the latest and greatest. If it's a knife, I'm interested. So thanks for watching. I hope you guys have an amazing day, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.